Welcome to Tea Book Club, a discussion on Michael Cunningham's Specimen Days. This event is presented by the House of Chanel. Hello, I'm Hanya Yanagihara, the Editor-in-Chief of Tea Magazine. Thanks so much for joining us for this installment of Tea Book Club, for which we're talking about Michael Cunningham's 2005 novel, Specimen Days. Told in three parts, it's a book that spans centuries and genres, but with a focus on Walt Whitman and the American mythology throughout. Leading tonight's discussion is the novelist Neil Mukherjee, who will be joined by Cunningham himself. I hope you enjoy the presentation, and please visit tmagazine.com for more on the novel and on past selections. Good evening, and welcome to Tea Book Club. I'm Kate Guadagnino, a tea contributor, and I'm so pleased to be here for the final installment of this round of our series. Since August, we've been exploring New York City novels, and tonight we'll conclude the season with a discussion of Michael Cunningham's 2005 novel, Specimen Days. It's a story told in three parts. One takes place in the past, one in the near present, and one in a dystopian future. The poetry of Walt Whitman, passionate chronicler of New York City life, as well as the very soul of America, shows up in some form in all three. We'll first hear from Neil Mukherjee, who is the author of multiple novels, including A Life Apart, which won the Writers Guild of Great Britain Award for Best Fiction, The Lives of Others, which was a finalist for the Man Booker Prize, and most recently, A State of Freedom. After Neil's talk, Michael will join and answer questions, some of them submitted by readers, about the book. He is the author of the novels A Home at the End of the World, The Hours, and of course, Specimen Days, among others. He's been the recipient of a Pulitzer Prize, a Whiting Award, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. If you have any additional questions or comments, please share them in the chat. And now I'm honored to introduce Neil Mukherjee. Specimen Days by Michael Cunningham is three novels in one. Historical fiction, police procedural thriller, and sci-fi. Not jumbled up together, of course, but in three discrete narratives. Discrete is the key word here. So much of the joy in reading this book is to see the leaps it makes over the spaces separating the three stories. And separate they are, for Cunningham has taken out all the connective tissue one might expect, such as plot or character between the stories. It is a novel in three distinct different stories. What unites them then might be the first question one might ask, or what kind of continuity does it present? A point about coherence and unity has been addressed in the essay trailing this recording, so I shall try and approach this a little differently. There is a white bowl that appears in each of the three stories. Here is a description of it in the first story, which is set in the 1880s. It was bright in the evening light, almost unnaturally so. It might have been carved from pearl. Its line of strange symbols its blue curls and circles stood out boldly, like a language that insisted on its own cogency in a world that had lost the skill to decipher its message. In all the three stories in Cunningham's novel, it stands out as something special, something val valuable beyond expression, each viewer arrested by it. Here is Cat, the detective who is the central character of the second story in a tatty junk shop on Broadway catching her first glimpse of it. Among the coils of jewelry was a bowl half hidden. It had been carelessly filled with gold tone brooches, a strand of fake pearls, but the rim showed, pale and bright as the moon, decorated along its upper edge with symbols of some sort, which might have been flowers or sea anemones or stars. Junk. It was probably junk. What else could it be, considering where it had ended up? And yet, it didn't look like junk even in the fluorescence of the shop window. It seemed to emit a faint but perceptible glow, like a wristwatch in the dark, though it was pure, pure white. It looked, from what she could see of it, like a displaced treasure, something genuinely rare, mistaken for dross. These things turned up every now and then, didn't they? The Da Vinci drawing slipped in among the botanical prints, the Melville letter stacked with old bills and yellowed shopping lists. The bowl was, in fact, something. Anyone could see it. It was about the size of a sparrow's nest, luminous. It seemed to amplify the room's stagnant illumination. In the final section, the dystopian sci-fi section set in the future, 
The bowl is acquired as junk, perceived as junk, yet the buyer, a boy called Luke, wants to take it on a journey to outer space, an imminent journey on a spaceship. Here is Simon, the protagonist of that story, contemplating it. It appeared to put out a faint glow in the darkening room. Simon thought he could see the bowl on another planet sometime in the next century, sitting on a shelf where it would silently reflect an alien light. This small and fragile object, bearing its untranslatable message, would travel to another sun, although it was neither rare nor precious. Now we have a beautiful object that augments the light in a room, indeed seems to shed light. Life is short, the characters in each of the segments are dead in the subsequent story, but art is long. Look at the luminous little bowl which we first see in the 1880s, then in the early 2000s, then again in, in, in what, 2122, 2322? In a novel about transcendence, here is the most immortal thing above all, the thing that can transcend even time, art. Something created by the marriage of human imagination and skill, a bowl, an android who develops consciousness, self-awareness, emotions, a heart in short, or a book, the leaves of grass, for example, or the work of any writer who writes. Writing is a message in a bottle thrown into the sea of time. Who knows what will survive? Fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil, Milton reminds us. This bowl, I feel, is Cunningham's nod to Keats's Grecian urn, yet another object that has transcended time. Here is what Keats says to the urn at the end of his poem. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain, in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. No one in specimen days can read what the runes on its rim say or represent, and yet it appears to voice the kind of truth that Keats believes, believes his urn contains. What will survive of, his, of us is love, the poet Philip Larkin claimed, but perhaps what really will survive of us is art. Now closely aligned to this point about art is a thread running through the novel about outsiders. Let us look at one such moment where it is fully articulated. In the final section, preparations for a journey are underway. And it's no ordinary journey. It's a mission to find another inhabitable planet because the Earth is kind of finished. Cunningham admirably keeps most of the details of this depletion of the planet off stage. But what darting, gleaming hints there are seem to point to a breakdown of civil society, a military industrial takeover, a police state, exhaustion of all resources, poisoning of everything, large swathes of population just wiped out. The picture is bleak. In the midst of all this, Emery Lowell, the scientist who built Simon, the android, uh, who is called the Simulo in this novel, and others like him, has cobbled together a spaceship and a wild melange of crew members, including children, aliens, children who are half human, half aliens, strays. He's arranged for all of them to leave Earth and journey into the unknown in the hope of finding a planet where they can put down roots. It is on this journey that the luminous white bowl is going. Here's Simon contemplating this venture, something resembling literally a backyard venture. Crazy, Simon thought. They're all crazy. Though, of course, the passengers on the Mayflower had probably been like this too. Zealots and oddballs and ne'er-do-wells setting out to colonize a new world because the known world wasn't much interested in their furtive and quirky passions. It had probably always been thus, not only aboard the Mayflower, but on the Viking ships, on the Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria, on the first convoys sent off to explore Nadia, about which the people of Earth had harbored such extravagant hopes. It was not jobs. It was hysterics and visionaries and petty criminals. The odes and monuments, the plaques and pageants, all came later. This is one of the great insights Simon has, that the world keeps turning because of outsiders, unassimilated people who stand away from the mainstream, the general mill. It's artists here, and I'm using artists in the broadest sense of the term as creative people, inventors such as Emery Lowell, or the maker of that luminous bowl. It's artists, visionaries, crazies, who usher in new phases of historical development, who have an intuitive access to a greater truth, as Lucas, the child in the first section of the novel does. 
or even the mastermind behind the terrorism that wreaks havoc on New York City in the second story. Visionary is an interesting word to use of all of them. They see something, although not with their eyes, something that others cannot see, cannot understand, or even if they could, they wouldn't know what to do with that knowledge. In the middle of all this, Cunningham sets loose a real visionary, meaning a historical person who was a visionary, Walt Whitman, throughout his pages. Now, we're honored to have Michael Cunningham here with us so we can direct the question to him. Michael, welcome. Do you have a story about Whitman's influence on you? I do. I was reading Whitman um, in college uh, because Whitman had been assigned. I was a college student and, and I did most of the reading and I got to a point, a moment in Leaves of Grass in which Whitman says, I considered long and seriously of you before you were born. I am as good as looking at you now for all you cannot see me. And I just thought, whoa, Whitman, <laughs> here you are, you are, you are recording among many, many other phenomena, me not yet born, you are imagining me, you are looking at me now. And um, never mind the narcissist, I, I know he was looking at a lot of people other than me, but it was, I think, my first sort of palpable sense of literature's ability to actually transcend the time-space continuum. That, that, that's, that, that suddenly in my dorm room, time and space collapsed. And there, there was Whitman, there were Whitman and I looking at each other through a portal. And I was never quite the same since. And I have, and I have a Whitman tattoo right here. I'm not going to show it to you. Now, now, that was a question from Pat McPherson of Pennsylvania. While, while we are on the subject of um, uh, uh, Whitman, uh, you, um, um, there, there is a, a, a continuing sense that um, he means a lot to the idea and the nation of America. And here's a question from Patricia Dolan of Florida. Why does Whitman continue to resonate with the soul of America? That's a good question. Um, Whitman was arguably the last undiluted optimistic American. Whitman was, as far as I know, and for my own purposes, the last great mind who looked around him at this new nation and and didn't didn't see it in any kind of rosy way. Saw it in saw it for all of its injustice and and terrors and beauties, and essentially recorded in Leaves of Grass, along with much else, the possibility here um, with the Fitzgerald line when when humankind beheld for the last time a continent commensurate with th their capacity for wonder. Um, Whitman got there first. And I think for those of us who continue to love him, who continue to love this gigantic continually revised book that he worked on all his life. It is, it's the last expression of sort of un, undiluted, undiluted hope attached to an America that, that very soon began to change and began to be less the shining object, the great social and 
cultural experiment that Whitman knew it to be. And now you, you, you said something interesting in an essay once while writing about Whitman was that you feel that the threat to America, again, as an idea, because America is an idea, um, America is a great experiment. Um, you you think the threat to the idea of that experiment and the practice of that experiment, the, the nation of America itself, the threat to America is always going to be from within and not without. Do you think Whitman was aware of it? And I feel you are hyper aware of this in Specimen Days because in, in, in a way, the outside world does not exist. It's a, it's, it's a novel where you're meditating about yeah. your nation. Yeah. Um, uh, and you used a very interesting expression earlier on when you said, uh, reading Whitman, you got the sense of time and space collapse. And um, the book enacts, uh, your book enacts this, uh, uh, this collapse of time and space in the way you jump through those large segments of time. You use different genres. Can, can I separate out two strands in this question and direct them to you one after the other? One is about the threat to America from within and the idea about genre and this, the space-time collapse that you talked about. Sure, sure, sure. Um, America has never felt as endangered as it does now. I, I, I don't think think it's an exaggeration to say that we are looking fairly seriously at the collapse, the possible collapse of democracy. Um, our rights are being continually revoked. I don't know if Whitman would have written anything resembling leaves of grass if if you if you were actually to step through that that portal in the time space continuum i would i would i would love to walk around new york with walt whitman right now <laughs> and, and hear what he he had to say about about this 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 country that that he that he so loved with 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 a depth and fervor and a, a sort of almost feral passion that you wouldn't call patriotism. It wasn't that. It wasn't. It wasn't. Well, it was about politics. It was it leaves of grass. Is about ev is about everything. But it what it wasn't inherently political. It was just about the unstoppable life of America. Um, and like many, I, I, I worry a lot about, about where we are headed and I clutch leaves of grass to my chest every now and then just hope. Just, just hoping that some of its power will, act, it, some, some of it, some of its hopefulness, will actually sort of enter my body and and infect me in the best possible sense. Um, these are terrifying times. And that idea about you know time and space collapsing, which uh, I mentioned, that your book does so well. Um, uh, you know, each of these stories that constitute your novel uh, uh, is is a different genre. There, there's a uh, uh, there's historical fiction, there's a police procedural uh, thriller or a crime fiction segment, and then there's a dystopian science fiction segment. I mean, you two collapse time and space categories, and particularly genre categories. Would you, would you mind saying a little bit more about genre? Because um, there seems to be a kind of tacit divide between uh, practitioners of mainstream realism, uh, psychological realism, lyrical realism, whatever you'd like to call it, and the, the fantasy, speculative, science fictional side of things. Um, and, and both sides seem to be at war all the time. You know, one side does not understand the other. Um, uh, this is a different kind of polarization, this time among the, amongst literary readers. Um, uh, uh, I mean, and one of the most refreshing things about Specimen Days was how you managed to put all these different genres together. 
Um, could you talk a little bit more about that, about what genre fiction means to you? Sure, sure, sure. I um, I would love to to do whatever I might be able to do to declare peace between the two between the two warring factions and the very idea that there is quote unquote serious literature, and then there is genre fiction. Um, the former, of course, it, you, it's it's hard to get people who ten people to read, the latter of which hundreds of thousands of people read eagerly. And I think it is a mistake to imagine that the people who read horror stories, science fiction stories, um, anything we call genre are somehow wrong. And and others other writers who who write Oh, I don't know. People ask me what kind of books I write. I don't know. It's about love and death, but but you know, in a fun way. Um, I I love the genres, um, and I think there are probably over in the various sections devoted to genre genres of various kind about as many bad books versus good books as there are in the serious section. Um, we, Henry James, Turner, Turner the Screw, wrote, uh, wrote a great ghost story of Ursula K, Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, the list goes on. Michael Connolly, um, Great detective novels, P. D. James. I I just think it's a mistake to to think of books like that. Raymond Chandler. The list go. The list goes on. Also, people like Peter Straub. Um, I'm interested in those books. I I I, I read I read those books along with with other books and I sometimes feel that there is something a little bit school marmish about um, the idea that the implication that, that, that this this book is just too much fun to be serious um, and so I wanted to I wanted to give it a try um, I wanted to see if I could if I could write in some satisfying way way within three of the of of the of the many genres um i was not surprised to find that it's harder than it looks to tell an actual ghost story or a thriller or a science fiction story it's 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 not something you just pick up and do um and I also, but I also wanted to to put a little twist on them. Um, for instance, in the science fiction story, we we I, I I I read nothing but science fiction when I was a little kid, um, and we always imagined. I always imagined whenever we make contact with life on another planet, they will be incredibly advanced. They will have, have magnificent cities under domes and, and, you know, have conquered all diseases, all the, all those, all those science fiction fantasies. And I, I thought, well, what if, what if, what if it wasn't like that? What if our first contact with people on another planet, beings on another planet, turned out to be a planet and a population so desperately poor and, and without resources in, a, in, in this kind of constant brain and drear with soil that won't produce, that they are just dying to get to America, to the, to, to the earth where they are consistently discriminated against and given the worst possible jobs. So, you know, it's, it's science fiction. 
but it's my it's 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 my own take. Um, it 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 feels like you've immersed yourself in science fiction for years and years before you write it, because you know Ian M. Banks used to say that um, it's such a difficult game, and 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 you know other writers, people who don't practice in science fiction, assume they can just come and dip their toes, and it's just way too difficult to do that. And you've done it, and wholly, entirely successfully, and and um, and I'm also glad to see the name of Ursula K. Le Guin crop up. I mean, I think of her as one of the great writers of the last century. Um, um, uh, so, so to move to a different genre now, um, uh, the the three genres that you have like devoured, and you decided to practice those genres in your own book. Um, was was writing this book a kind of liberation in 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 a way the fact that you could just stretch your wings and do something on a much bigger scale uh uh like three genres made to converse with each other um how how did it feel like writing this book were you were you anxious were you exhilarated that you were you you could at last do this um, you know, I, I guess I would have to say that I'm, I'm always anxious and occasionally exhilarated <laughs> no matter what I'm, I'm writing. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, I think that's a fairly, a fairly natural state for most people who write. Um, yes, on one hand, Yahoo, a thriller a ghost story, a science fiction story, but I think always, always, I, I know, I know you understand this. Um, you get into it and you realize that, that no matter what you try to write, um, it's, it's always difficult. However, you approach storytelling to simulate life using only language and and ink and paper if that's what you use it's it always it always always kind of resists our attempts to 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 summon real life using using the english language and and you know i'm i'm always aware of the fact that Virginia Woolf picked up a dictionary and wrote and found to the lighthouse in it. And then Toni Morrison picked up the same dictionary and found beloved in it. And even if it's a foray into the quote unquote less serious I don't consider them less serious, but you know the quote unquote a, a, a walk a walk on the quote unquote less serious side. There is still that sense that that yeah. What about Ursula Le Guin? What about Henry James and Turn of the Screw? Um, it's it's a funny it's a funny business writing. Um, it always sounds like it's going to be fun, and then you get into it's just not that fun. Um, hey, hey, I, I, should, I should add that there are days when it's great. It's not, it's, 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 I, I, I think we who write may make a little too much of, of the, of the constant torture of it. If, if I didn't also love doing it, if there weren't days when I felt, like, Ooh, well, that one, that one, that sentence kind of sings. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it, but, 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 um, it never feels easy to me. It never feels like a romp. I wish. Now, now to stick stick to the to just one more thing to to go a slightly different place with genre again. Uh, we have a question from a reader, a Paige Oliver, who lives abroad, has asked: Were there any planned movie adaptations of the book, and what happened in their development? And I know you have a very good answer to this question. <laughs> um, yes, yes. I wrote um, an adaptation of the third, the third of the three, the, 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 the science fiction, um, the science fiction story 
Um, this was some time ago, but I was going to do it with some secret. I was going to do it with um, Julianne Moore, um, who was going to play a lizard-like woman from another planet. And we were having coffee, and she said something about how she would just love to play a lizard-like woman from another planet, and proceeded to shift the bones, the plates of her skull, so as to look lizard-like. And I thought, well, there you have it. That's, that's, that's something an actor can do. I can't do that. And, um, you know, a, a, an actor like, like Julianne is, is, is made of some slightly different material than the rest of us are. Um, and then like most things in Hollywood, it just, it just didn't happen. Um, a little, a little too, a little too, a little too eccentric and a little too expensive. Um, but. But you wrote a whole screenplay. You, 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 you have an entire screenplay. You wrote the whole screenplay. And one of the wonderful things you said to me was that uh, here was a second chance a writer never gets in order to revisit their work and actually tweak all the things that did not work the first time around. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a book is always, to some degree, a first draft, even if you've written it 35 times. And um, here came the chance a couple of years later to really look at it and rethink it. And I do, I would love having written the adaptation to go back and make some of the changes, some of those changes to the original. Um, it would. It was. It feel. It was tighter. It has a couple of twists that I wished I had thought of when I wrote. When I wrote the novel. Um, yeah. 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 It, it's. It's something you hardly ever get a, ch a chance to sort of re revisit a novel in in another form and see if you can do just a little better. Um. Michael, you mentioned uh, a, a ghost story, and um, uh, we'll end with a question from a reader, uh, which picks up on that point. Ryan Lewis of Colorado has asked, one of the beautiful things about a narrative across time is that each progressive story gets to be haunted by the previous ones. But is this the accurate word for you, haunted? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with the word haunted. And yes, uh, you mentioned the bowl. The, the each, each, each of the three stories involves essentially the same three central characters, variously transmogrified and mutated. But, but I, I wanted there to be a, a thread that that sort of connected, connected several threads that connected all three of them. And of course. Thank, thank you, Walt Whitman, for the for the special guest appearance that you didn't get to consent to, um, because the dead have no rights. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I am haunted by Walt Whitman and and Virginia Woolf and other other. Artists I love, um, but I, you know, I, I, I think I think as a species we are prone we are prone to hauntings. Um, I, for one, am also haunted by a musician called Perfume Genius. It's it's not I'm not not all of my hauntings are quite are quite are quite so rarefied and or classical. Right. But I I, I I I know I know I'm not alone in in this. There there are are artists, scientists, politicians, hard to think of many, but you know what I mean. Um who who 
inhabit us in ways that that most that most people don't. Um, we we are. Who said we are all haunted houses? Um, anyway, I, I somebody said said that it wasn't me. Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Who wouldn't Who wouldn't want to be sort of inhabited by by any number of 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 figures, past and present, who help to animate and and enliven us as we go through our days. That's a good point on which to conclude things. But I will ask you one last question. Who or what is haunting you at the moment in terms <laughs> of your work? Um, you know, I am currently haunted by a new novel that I've that I've just finished. Um, I am trying to, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to exorcise that particular haunting. I'm trying to just sort of let it go. But I'm sure you know about this too. It's, 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 it's hard to let we let something like that go. It's hard to feel like this is finished um, because I think. Certainly, anybody who creates, and I think the word "create" is large and it includes much of what many people do. I feel like we are all, well, many of us, are sort of haunted by the discrepancy between. Well, just let's let's say a book. Um, I wonder the discrepancy between the sort of impossibly great book you had in mind, that cartoon balloon floating over your head, the book of love and fire, the book that 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 says everything you know and can imagine, and um, and the book you're actually able to write, which might be quite perfectly good, um, but there is that discrepancy between the ideal. Thing and the actual thing, and that's 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 the ghost rattling its chains around inside inside me right now, and I'm 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 ready for that ghost to to desert me, so I can um, well go back to listening to Perfume Genius over and over and over again. Michael, thank you. It was a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you for doing this. That concludes this iteration of Tea Book Club. A special thanks to Neil and Michael for being so illuminating. You can find Neil's essay on specimen days at teamagazine.com. If you'd like to continue the conversation, follow us on Twitter at Tea Magazine and use the hashtag Tea Book Club. Finally, thank you to you, our listeners and fellow readers, for joining us tonight and throughout this entire season. We've so enjoyed exploring these books with you.